Leads, leads, leads. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours. I'm your host Simon, and with this show, I want to ask 1,000 lawyers over the 2020s the second question that everybody asks everybody: What do you do? Please like, share, and subscribe to the show. If you're a lawyer, then be my guest on the show. What do you do? Tell me about it. Go to western-studios.com/b-on-a-podcast or email workinghourspod at western-studios.com You can follow the show on Twitter at westernstudios2 and on Instagram at western underscore studios underscore leads You can support the show with a one-off donation on Ko-fi so that's ko-fi.com ko-fi dot com slash working hours or to offer more regular support you can subscribe to this show for as little as a pound a month on Patreon that's patreon.com forward slash working hours pod This is episode 10, the final episode of volume 1, 2020. Uh, There will be a bonus episode over Christmas, which will be available for the Patreons. So if you're interested in that, go and see the Patreon and become a subscriber. It starts from a pound and the only option that's on there at the moment is a pound to make it accessible to everybody. Um, This is my final rubbish intro. Again, I'm going to keep this one short, but I'm going to script some intros and redo all the intros from volume one. I'm going to go back and add time codes and more detailed show notes, and I will be getting the show onto iTunes next year. So that's that's all in the works. Um, as far as this goes for this episode, I will be keeping it short again. So let's get into episode 10. I will be back at the end. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks. Bye. What did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, uh, I wanted to be an IT professional. Really? From a young age? I decided, I decided when I was 13 that's what I was going to do. Before that, obviously an astronaut, hmm. fighter pilot maybe. So, uh, yeah, so what do you do now? Uh, I'm an IT security consultant. And uh, so have you basically just gone straight into that and stayed in that field or did you go through any other sort of roles first? Uh, so after coming out of university, I got offered two roles with the company that I did the work placement on mm-hmm. um, from the university work placement. And uh, one was working in IT support and the other, the other was being an Oracle database administrator working in Matlock uh, on uh, Good Money. So obviously I went for the for the high-flying uh, Oracle DBA uh, consultancy role and did that for a couple of years but then got the opportunity to move over to the network and security team within the same company. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was based in Nottingham. So I was driving to Nottingham um, every day. And uh, yeah, my skill set in the IT security area started there, really. Mm -hmm. Um, The university was a good grounding base, I guess, because I did a computer communications degree at university. Mm -hmm. Um, The other ones, once... uh, I got into the networking and security thing. Um, it was very much more my type of thing than doing Oracle DBAs or SQL statements and co- coding, basically. Um, not a massive fan of coding, so uh, the networking side and security aspects is, is a much better fit for me. And then I've run with that for the last 15 years or so. Okay, so what 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 is the difference there then? What What makes it better? What makes the coding worse? Like... Is one more sort of cognitive work or harder work, or what? What's the distinction? I, I would I would say my role that, that I've gone into is maybe more for more customer focused, more customer engaging, uh, rather than when you're an Oracle DBA, you're more uh, in the back end of a system, troubleshooting their databases, fixing their databases, making sure their databases run run okay. But there's very little engagement with the customer, mm. whereas the role I'm in now is much more of a consultancy role, so well, per, uh, a person-to-person uh, security role. So I'm, I'm assisting customers in learning the products, rolling out the products, rather than just the Oracle DBA role, which is you just go in, sit in a room, mm. do your thing, and then leave the room, and that, and that was it. So it's a uh, so from a from a, a um, an interaction perspective, it's it's more interactive with, with the customer base. From a IT 
perspective, it's there's you know there's there's still levels of command line coding and what you've got to do, but it's uh it's more engaged, I would say, doing uh network and networking and security compared to being an Oracle DJ. So would you would you agree then or would you say that it's more collaborative to do the consulting work? I mean, you're working with the client directly, and I get the impression that on the DBA stuff, you're 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 more isolated. It's more of a come in, do your work, go home. A bit more repetitive, yeah. doing the same yeah. sort of stuff every day. Yeah, and for some people, you know, they 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 work that way. Mm-hmm. So and they prefer that way. So the current company I've got, you know, we've we've got a team, and there's several individuals in that team who are not customer focused even though it's a support team mm-hmm. but they are heavily um coding focused and we need people to be sitting sit in a room for three or four hours and code a, you know code a script and write out a script and do stuff so we're still we well every business business needs our team type of people i'm not that type of person mm-hmm. I'm, I'm much more the type of person who wants to be in front of the customer helping them helping them understand what they're doing and understand the pro- the project and helping the project go through and so I've, I've become much more of a facilitator mm-hmm. uh, nowadays or what what the business likes to call a, a trusted advisor all right so is that your is that part of your title then your job role no, no it's, it's what it's what it's what the it's what the industry classes classes what I, what I do as a trusted advisor so i'm non non sales but i build a technical relationship with the customer to the point where they Trust what I tell them. You, you, you can. You don't have to be a consultant to do that. You don't have to be. You could just be a support engineer who does that. But but you basically build up a trusted advisor role. Um, so that's kind of where I've developed my skill set and, and and led. So and where 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 I'm, where I'm at now is basically at the top of the tree when it comes to dealing with customers. So I uh, look after the premium accounts, premium support, and. That's very much of a interaction going on with the customer, um, building that relationship and building that trusted trust, trust advisor role. Um, and uh, so over the last three or four years, that's that's on-site consultancy work and um, premium premium support work is what I've been doing. But if you go back before that, I was doing you know just normal support work, so mm-hmm. I had to build my way up. Okay, how long have you been working now? Twenty years. Twenty years. So for the new role, for the trusted uh, advisor role, in terms of the soft skills for that, did they give any training, any support or guidance or anything? Or was it more just like they were looking for a person with the aptitude for it and you, you, you just showed aptitude? Uh, I think it's very much on the person. I think you can, training helps, training assists, uh, it opens your eyes to certain concepts that maybe you were already doing, mm-hmm. didn't realise what you were doing. Uh, but I think it's very much down to the person as well. Mm-hmm. Some, like I say, some some people struggle a lot to engage with other people verbally. But if you put them on a uh, an email address and you know a support login ticket, they can do an excellent job. But if you ask them to pick up a phone and speak to a customer, they they you know they struggle. So, mm-hmm. but they but they're really good at. You know, the other side of the aspect, I I flourish being able to communicate verbally with, with people, get them to understand. So I, I went through phases of being a trainer, mm-hmm. uh, phases of being just doing normal support, and then I've kind of ended up at the top of the tree where I can do pretty much everything now for, mm-hmm. for my current bit company. So I can go in and do a training course, I can go in and deliver consultancy, I can go in do pre-sales mm-hmm. uh, where I'm not, I'm not actually um, installing anything, just talk about the concept that right, we're trying to do with the customer. Uh, so, so training helps with that, but I'd say it's uh, a lot more of it comes from experience. Yeah, and the type of character that that person is. So, if we go back to just talking about dealing with the the customer, I'm guessing part of your role is basically trying to make the customer understand what they can and can't do for the money that they're spending. My experience of seeing organisations working with tech companies, especially like previous decades, there's a bit of a disconnect between what the customer expects and wants and how how the technical side views that, you know, it's like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. They're, they're trying to sell a prepackaged kind of product rather than something necessarily bespoke, or if they are going bespoke, you, they don't under, always understand what the customer needs because they don't necessarily understand that business and the 
the business side doesn't always understand the technical side of what can be delivered and how it can be delivered. So you get this weird sort of missing each other. Yeah, yeah so that, that happens on a weekly basis where yeah. sales guys will sell something and then once it's gone through the sales process and it comes down to the implementation, then that's when you find out what's, what the real requirements are and what the customer really wants and, and whatnot. But you can't get away from that because the sales guys have to have to do their thing. You know, you need you need sales beasts who go out and just sell anything to anybody. Otherwise, you don't get new business. Yeah. So it's a, it's a reality of the business we're working. Uh, they'll bring up an IT manager who ain't got a clue, and they'll fire off some buzzwords, data leakage prevention, GDPR, yeah. and that, that's the guy sold. And then when it comes to implementing it, that's when the actual work begins, and you just run through the requirements and and any uh, gotchas get highlighted and, and but that's my job to make it work basically so it's not my job to tell the sales guys not to sell stuff mm-hmm. to customers who don't need it no it's, it's my job to just implement it but i don't i don't lie to a customer so mm-hmm. that's the one thing i don't do is 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 affect my integrity with the customer mm-hmm. and uh, i've always been adamant about that I've, I've had i've had times in the past where sales guys ask you to lie to customers uh, not in the current company i work for uh, so I, I, I never want to work for a company like that again, where it's a, it's a ruthless sales environment. Yeah. You do need salespeople to be ruthless, mm. but um, I, I like to work for a company where there's a, a dividing line between those salespeople and the the non-salespeople, and there's there's a nice wall in between, which mm-hmm. which and, and that really works really well when you work for a company where there's there's not really that barrier and it's just an all out and out sales. With a bit of technical assistance to assist in that yeah. process, uh, that you know that works. It's a job, but it's not. It wasn't for me. So that, in the previous roles, that's one of the things I didn't like. Whereas the current customer, current person I'm working for, who I've been with for ten years now, mm. um, it's a much better sales to technical environment. But mm-hmm. you still do need sales guys to go out and sell stuff they don't understand. That's what sales guys do. Mm-hmm. And it's my job to to then pick up the mess and make it all work. Which I'm fine with. You know, I'm fine to fine being that guy to make it all work. So how much of this is is face to face? Are you there, like you know, are the salespeople just cold calling companies, or are they going out and like meeting people in an old style face to face meeting and trying to book appointments? They'll, they'll, they'll do both. Uh, obviously, not under the current environment. But historically, uh, yeah, they'll be they'll be on site. Uh, historically, a lot of consultancy work was was on, was on site. There's been a general trend over the last ten years. The company I work for now, they didn't allow anybody to work from home. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was the first person to talk them into allowing somebody to work from home. But but they are based in Reading down mm-hmm. south, so obviously I couldn't, I couldn't I wasn't there to move, so they offered me a remote role. And then over the years, they've gradually because uh, I've as organisations' concepts have changed about work from home and whatnot, um, it kind of it's gone in line with other organisations expecting consultants to be on site. Mm-hmm. So once they understand that you can deliver a quality service remotely, uh, then, then they're fine with. So there's been a gradual transition with organisations to allowing people to work from home, but also customers being okay with remote remote work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so there's, there's still times when. Um, in closed closed networks or military networks where it's all closed off, you still have to go on site. So there's still yet to be on the on site requirement. I, I I don't struggle over the phone. Um, I'm fine face to face and I'm fine over the phone. Obviously, with the uh, video conferencing age of Zoom and Microsoft Teams, it's we can all use video now, so it's even it's you know it's, it's pretty much the same as being sat in the room. Mm-hmm. Uh, and from a pro- productivity wise, you're not spending several hours on the motorway. Yeah. Um, you're not spending money in hotels. You're not spending money dining out so you reduce the cost base and you reduce the cost of the customer mm-hmm. uh, the customer's still getting the same service so it's a it's a win-win scenario that but it has been a gradual change i'd say 15 years ago there was no there was no there was no remote work or, mm. or very little remote work but then people had 512k internet connections or 512 you know very little inter- internet bandwidth so as mm. the internet has developed and internet access has developed it has allowed that remote working from home and uh, doing remote consultancy. How do people find it from, uh, you know, because you're doing security, how do people find the security side of that? You've, you hear these stories about, you know, the, the, the tales of people hacking into Zoom calls and in classrooms and so on. Like, is the is the video and the remote 
recording stuff is it generally quite safe quite secure does it depend on the packages that you're using do customers feel that this is secure uh, do they have the trust in it the, the best the best way to do is offer flexibility to the customer so there's several methods of doing remote being having a right test some customers are more flexible than others some customers will approve one method or, or another so uh, cisco webex has been a popular one over the last five ten years mm-hmm. um uh, Microsoft Teams is now taking a front role in, in that as well. There's a, a team viewer, and they had a security breach, and then customers did say, I'm, I'm not prepared to use team viewer, but mm. customers still are. I use, because I want to be able to facilitate the remote session, I offer whatever they want. So if it's, if it's Skype for business, if it's Skype for it's Teams. It used to be Skype for business, but now people moved over onto Teams now, so... Man, categories would be Skype for business. So it's either Teams, Microsoft Teams, uh, Team Viewer, Cisco, WebEx, Go Anywhere. There's also a, a, an application called Slack, which is similar to Discord, yeah. which also allows uh, similar uh, remote sessions. We use that from a bit in the business aspect. Uh, so yeah, it's all about facilitating the customer. There's normally one method which the customer is happy with. Mm-hmm. And from a security point of view, uh, as uh, yeah, I've, I've not seen any issues. Obviously, if you're um, if you're using a something like Zoom, where you've not really got direct control of what's going on, mm-hmm. and maybe it's not fully trusted. Then you keep the content as long as the content's not classified, then it's okay. So for any 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 military or government organisations, if it's if it's sensitive data, that would all be done on site in a in a closed room but with them. If it's sensitive data. If it's not sensitive, then, then most customers are happy to be doing it remotely. Well, what have been kind of the worst bits of the role and the best bits of the role? The first two jobs that I did were horrendous, so, horrendous soul-destroying mm. roles. But I felt that they definitely helped me develop to what I am now. So if I didn't go through those horrendous, work for those horrendous organisations where you are just you are just a number. Yeah, I mean, all, all organisations, you are just a number, but making it where, where you know you're just a number. And, uh, there's no and any point you can lose your role and, and whatnot, um, and it's all just a ruthless environment. I'm glad I worked in those. I didn't enjoy it, but I'm glad I did because then when you do finally work for an organisation which is good and it is good, it does look does look after its staff and uh, and is considerate and and then you you sit back and go, oh my god, wow, I, I, this is amazing. Yeah, this is I'm working for a good company. I yeah. did, never thought you know because you've been used to working for previous previous two organizations so i've only had three jobs since leaving leaving university mm. so, uh, through three different um, organizations and uh, i think it was five years five years and then now 10 years with the current organization mm. but yeah those first two roles uh even though they were horrendous and there was days where i just didn't want to go into work mm. and uh, there was days that I didn't the, the drive down to nottingham and back was just i was getting to a point where i'm just happy to chuck it all in and uh, on that first role, the Nottingham role, I did get to that point and just jacked it in. Mm. And then um, the second role, I, uh, we hit the recession and yeah. everybody, got, everybody got made redundant. And then um, the current role, I'd been unemployed for a week and he got wind that I'd been made redundant. Uh, did my current manager and he rang me up and he asked me to start as soon as I can. Mm-hmm. So I had a couple more weeks off and then started a... Uh, you know, for 10 years I've been working with this organisation. So it was a, I f- fell on my feet, basically. It was, a, I was lucky. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, those, those, those first two jobs were horrendous, but I'd say they definitely put me in good stead to where I am now. That's given you, I mean, it's given you all sorts of different skills. I mean, if you learn patience as well, like if you're doing a horrible job, it's good to learn patience. And that can always, that's always a useful skill to have within any industry. How's, how's the actual lockdown affecting things then? Um, does it make much difference to your work? I suppose it's it's not a major difference to you at the moment. Well, if anything, it's 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 enhanced what I can do. Yeah. Because because I've been working from home for um, current organisation for ten years. I do go down to I do go down to the office um, four times a year, you know, three three four days at a time. So I do, I do go into the office quite a bit. Uh, obviously not with the current situation. But what it's done is it's made everybody else more engaging. From a, an online perspective, because they were all sat in an office together, mm. most of the support, support guys and consultants. So they would bounce, you know, they just turn around and speak to each other over the shoulder. Yeah. And uh, so for us, 
well, I think there's, there was three three remote guys uh, when COVID hit. Um, we were, um, you know, we, we, we you know we were doing his job, but there wasn't much engagement on the on Slack or on the forums or the, the methods that we have to communicate. Yeah. Because uh, they would all sat in the office together. Yeah. So now they're all working from home. That's it's 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 just been like a bright light for me. You know, there's there's, there's more team meetings, there's virtual coffee meetings at eleven o'clock every day. You know, where I'm seeing people that I wouldn't. I'd see once once or twice a year when I went into the office. Yeah, so it's like suddenly you've got loads of colleagues. I've got suddenly I've got loads of colleagues. Suddenly all the um, support channels and consultant channels um, are full of questions and answers and stuff that I can engage with. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, you know, some people have, have been finding it hard because I've been working from home for so long now. It's, if anything, it's it's frustrating that I can't go out because I've always had the ability to go out, even though I've worked from home. Whereas now I don't have that ability. Whereas yeah. The other, for the other people, they've always been out, and now they have to forced to work in in the bedrooms and whatnot. Whereas that's never been a problem problem for me. Um, but I do miss being able to pop out. You know. Once a week or twice a week that I might, might actually go out. Mm. Um, so initially it wasn't too bad. I think in the last couple of weeks it's getting to the point where it's just a bit, a little bit. So it's not quite right. You know, you, you want you want a bit of go. You, you want that option to go to the coast and the toilets to be open. The toilets, you know, that option wants. Even though I might yeah. not take it. Yeah. Even though I might, I might go right. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to sit and. Uh, Build a new computer or something. Mm. Have, that, have that, that option not being there has got to a point now where it's grinding, yeah. grinding me down, like grinding it all down a bit. Yeah, mm. even though I thought I was, but, but then you know the wife, she's got a lot of colleagues as well uh, who work in London and based in London. Mm-hmm. You know, some people, some people in there have been sat in their own room for six or seven weeks. They don't have a garden. Mm. They don't have a balcony. Mm. So they must be even in a worse position than, than where I am. Yeah. Garden. Yeah. One thing I didn't do is panic buy enough. <laughs> so you did a big panic buy? Uh, no, we we bought stuff before the panic buy started. Mm. So, because I knew the panic buy was going to come, uh, um, so we did do quite a few, quite a few big shops. But once the lockdown hit, we realised we'd actually need to buy enough stuff and probably not the right stuff as well. <laughs> um, well, that's why they call it panic buying. Well, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, the freezer should have been, you know, half full of. Well, it should have been half full of milk and bread, really. Because mm. uh, you buy, you know, you buy lots of stuff. We didn't go mad on toilet paper or like, like everybody else. We were just buying what we normally buy, but just doubling up. Mm. But yeah, when uh, when we ran out, of, when we were getting short on milk after the first couple of weeks, we were like, why don't we buy more milk? <laughs> well, hindsight's twenty twenty. We've got we've got forty eight cans of beans. We've got forty eight cans of ravioli. <laughs> Eight cans of, of chopped tomatoes. We've got four pints of milk. What's going on? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that that's that's been interesting. So, if we're going to a second wave, you know what to get for the next slot. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> big, a big a new freezer. <laughs> um, but they, I don't think there's going to be a second phase. I think there's just going to be a very long, drawn out phase one that's going to run for the next eighteen months. So you're expecting not to not to be out. I mean, you've not been furloughed or anything, have you? You've been sort of well, working. We don't know because we we're, we're we're actively in support and doing sort of uh, work to do. So no, we've not. And uh, the wife, she's considered a key worker, so she can't either. So has it affects the level of business though? Have you seen a drop off or an increase or? So so the re- the redundancies uh, have first round of redundancies has happened. Yeah, uh, we had a, we had an eight point five percent reduction in in, in headcount. Mm-hmm. Uh, I fully expect more. Um, uh, if I ma- uh, maintain my job in eighteen months, I'd consider myself lucky. Um, we're going into, as far as I'm concerned, we're going to go into. Um, we are in a recession. We're going to, how long the recession lasts will depend on um, how how. Businesses like mine come out of it, but basically, what the way I see it is, we're gonna have eighteen months, two years recession, mm-hmm. and in about two years' time, we might be back. IT managers might be back to the point where they're spending what they're spending now. Mm-hmm. So the way the way the way it works is, you, know, you have a recession, the financial director squeezes everybody, the IT managers' budget gets squeezed, 
he has less money to spend on consultancy or buy new products, so he spends less. Mm -hmm. We're working in that industry, so there's basically a 20-30% reduction in what people are buying. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's all about trying to just uh, keep keep the current customers and keep keep them renewing mm -hmm. uh, will be will be the strategy for the next 18, 18 months, two years. Um, but if if uh, profits are going down to the point where we're losing money, then there'll, there'll be more staff that left. So, so, so I expect in the IT security arena, within the IT industry, but especially in the IT security, um, a, a quarterly reduction for the next quarterly reduction on the staff. So every quarter we'll lose staff. Mm. If depending on the recession and how, how long the recession lasts, but I expect us to lose staff quarterly for the next eighteen months. This is, this is probably a difficult question to answer, and it's probably quite an unfair question given that you know, like the, the wider economy. But do you think? I mean, firstly, are you worried about if if you did get a redundancy, would you still feel that you'd be able to find something quite quickly? And secondly, do you feel that? Do you think this is a bit of a, a pattern within IT overall? Do you think it's a pattern that will repeat going forward? Is it kind of like an industry that expands quite large and yes, then contracts yes. quite? Which, which is which is what happened in the in the, the last big recession, uh, financial recession. So um, the IT the firm I was working for, the we were doing a hundred million turnover in in security products, and that went down to ten million. Yeah. So um, within within the quarter, so. so Basically, you can't maintain that level of staff when you you've lost ninety percent of your business, mm -hmm. and it, it probably took them a couple of two or three years for for that to recover to to where it was. Uh, so it's 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 a natural thing. Um, it's if you work in this industry, it's one of the first that gets hit because um, IT managers are not going to go out and buy new funky soft uh, new funky uh, toys to play with. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that works in our favour is the GDPR laws uh, or the data leakage prevention laws because IT managers still need to prevent data leakage, they still need to pre present, um, prove that they're the GDPR is uh, compliant, mm -hmm. so the uh, any customer data has not been has been removed from their networks. Mm -hmm. So this, that's still quite, that's a big part of what we do as a business. Mm -hmm. So there's still, you know, there's still doors where we will be getting business coming in but it's, it won't be as much. You know, the IT manager's budgets are going to get slashed. Mm -hmm. um, from what I have to say. It all depends on how bad the recession is, but I'm expecting a bad recession. So I suppose the other side of that, I mean, especially with GDPR as well, uh, and the sort of general the general data protector regulations, what, what do you see coming out of Brexit for that kind of thing? Like, is that going to create more opportunities for you? Is it going to create less? I mean, will the... Do you, from what you know from an industry side, do you think that the law will become more like stricter and more work will need to be done, or do you think it'll be loosened up and it, there'll be less bother about it? Uh, so I think the GDPR is uh, European Union, European yeah, yeah. Union, isn't it? Yeah. I think we, I think they're just going to do a direct copy of it, mm. or a very similar direct copy of it. So there'll be still similar rules in place. Mm -hmm. Is 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 my impression? Okay. I want to cover a bit. About the actual work stuff. So, what would you what would you say to people that you sort of top priorities from a security perspective? I mean, like you know, obviously we're talking about business clients here rather than personal clients. So, what what are the sort of main things that businesses need to recognise, maybe beyond the the uh, statutory obligations? Just so, just ask that question again. So, in terms of a business, beyond their uh, legal obligations for what they what they have to do at a minimum. What are the top security things that businesses should be aware of that they maybe don't think of, or what are the weak spots for for the industries that you work with? Like, what are the the main things that they don't recognise? Because uh, I can imagine a lot of companies just think, oh well, you know, it's like that thing you hear you hear stories about companies being hacked, and then. It's not really until they've been hacked or they've had a few attacks that they kind of go, oh, actually, we need to really up so, our game. So, so, so that's always been the case. It's always been in a reactionary industry. Uh, it, you always, it always needs an IT uh, financial director to get a spoofed email and then fill in an, an invoice to a dodgy website and then realise they've done it before they, they start giving money to the IT manager to go 
to go fix things. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't say that's that's not always the case. There's, there's proactive businesses out there who understand and head off the head off the problem before it occurs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's other companies out there. Um, historically, councils used to be like this, uh, or, or public organisations that they they wouldn't react until they've had a, a data leakage, mm-hmm. and then and then they've been told to, to, to address it. Whereas uh, um, private organisations, I think, are, have been historically a bit more proactive um, in, in that in that sense. Um, I don't know. How, when I'd have to go look at the, the fines that have been allocated to, to see if that's actually true. Mm-hmm. But that's my impression. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do know of several. Uh, government organisations, councils, and whatnot, have been fined because of data leakage, mm-hmm. and then have acted off the back of that. Um, I'd say, in a in a general sense, customers um, buy our products to uh, stop viruses getting into their networks and um, spam getting into their networks and stop their users accessing going on to, to websites that they, should, they shouldn't be going on. Mm-hmm. But the sophistication of um, attacks nowadays, it's not as simple as just scanning for viruses yep. or scanning for known spam lists. Uh, it's all very targeted now. So if a uh, scammer is it wants to get some money out of a business, there's two ways you can go about it. Like mass mass market, you know, mass spam emails or, mm-hmm. so, or try and hack a web, no website and, and, and embed something in that. Um, so he's, 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 he's like mass, he's trying to, uh, he'll send out, he'll send out a million emails and he'll, if he gets two hits, then, you know, he's happy because he's got two hits out of his million emails. He'll make, he'll make hundred dollars off those two hits, but it's only cost him $10 to send out a million emails, for mm. example. Um, but that's the old way and that's the standard way. And we, it's, it's moving much more into a sophisticated attack, whereas, the, uh, the the attacker will set up a, a legitimate website. He'll have a legitimate domain. He'll jump through all the security hoops to make that domain legitimate. He'll send lots of legitimate emails. He'll get a very high trust rating on the internet. And they'll do a targeted spear attack on an individual in an organization. And that's his entire aim. It's just that one email to that one individual to get that one high payoff. Mm. Um, and that type of attack is very hard to uh, to uh, protect yourself against. Mm-hmm. And the average IT manager who just wants antivirus detection and spam detection, he's not he's not protecting himself from that type of attack. Mm-hmm. But as as those type of attacks occur, you then get the IT managers learning and wanting to do wanting to do more stuff about it. Mm-hmm. So historically, it's all been you know you just scan for spam, you scan for viruses. There's mm-hmm. not not a real big issue. Uh, if you get a machine infected with a virus, you just unplug it and, and format it. Whereas now it's it's moving to a much more sophisticated attack where the website you go to is a legitimate website. It's got the little padlock to say that it's safe and, mm-hmm. and whatnot. And it looks like a legitimate website. It's come from a leg- legitimate domain. It's gone through all the checks. But because it's a single target attack, it gets to all the defenses. Mm-hmm. So it's in that sense, it's more about education of the user, making the user think. Mm-hmm. So we spend a lot of time now on trying to educate customers and educate the user base to think before they open and think before they click on that link or mm-hmm. think before they click on that attachment. Uh, so we can, we'll still try and do lots of protection before it gets to them. But the biggest protection nowadays is education thinking yeah. before they click on, on, the, on, on what they think is a legitimate invoice mm-hmm. or, or a legitimate email from uh, IT, IT uh, so their financial director. Mm. So yeah, there's definitely been a development there, and it's only going to continue down the sophisticated route. Yeah. So how do you, th- you know, you hear the media at the moment talking a lot about, uh, you know, one side of the media kind of, oh, this is going to change everything. Everyone's going to be working from home, and they're just going to be sat at home. But there's, you know, there's a lot of security risks with that, and as well the the technical issues as well. You know, like not everyone's got fast enough internet, and you you need to be able to have the due due diligence of people in the office and like how information is handled how much how much truth do you see in this sort of everyone working from home idea this this is the recent covid thing has made more productive people's eyes mm-hmm. to the point where actually we can work from home 
So I, obviously I've been an advocate of working from home because I wanted to work from home and not drive to Reading uh, or move, move my family down to Reading. Uh, and it, it, this has I, directors, managers, execs, all the way down to just normal employees, it's, it's made them realise that they can work from home. Mm-hmm. That said, there is going to be individuals out there. You have to have the right mindset to work from home. Mm-hmm. There are going to be individuals out there who are, who are not motivating motivate themselves or find it really hard to motivate themselves or the household, the kids again, it's, you know, they'd much prefer to be in the office. So I do expect um, the office to reopen mm-hmm. uh, towards the end of the year. I expect people to start going back into the office towards the end of the year. Um, and uh, I'd, 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 going forward after that, I think we'll be a lot more flexible as a business to allow work from home mm-hmm. uh, if you've got the resources. Um, we, we've been okay in the UK, the there's parent company in the US. I don't think they admit as many laptops and home networking, mm-hmm. and so they, it was harder for them. So I think they had to furlough a lot more people. Um, I think we were a lot more ready as a business over here in the UK. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd expect in two years' time, maybe 50% of the business working from home, 50% of the business in the office. I expect them to maybe downsize the office as well going forward. We've already started doing that with closing satellite offices. Mm-hmm. To reduce costs, so mm-hmm. I expect that. But I also see that there's some individuals who prefer to be in the office, do not like working from home, uh, cannot, do not have the productivity when they work from home. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I also see there's people who do have more productivity when working from home as well, because when they're in the office, maybe they just gas too much or uh, too busy playing pool or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there's going to be. Two sets of people that will come out of this, I think. But what it has done is open the eyes of the directors and exec teams and management that you know you can still do an effective role when working from home. So we, I mean, we've proved that. Yeah, I suppose a lot of that will come down, like the the reality of it really will come down to the financial of like, does it cost more to pay for this guy's fuel than to pay for his internet connection or or hers? You know, like, I, I don't think it'll be sort of lifestyle change or this is, everyone has to move to this. It will literally be the accountants just saying, this costs less, this costs more. Yeah, but I also think, it's, it, as, as I was speaking to the managing director about it, it's, it's, a lot, it's, a, it's about trust. If you, if you don't trust the individual to be productive from working home, then it's not going to work. So I, th- I think the financials is a big part of it. Mm-hmm. If you, if you if that individual is going to be more productive in the office mm-hmm. and he knows it and the manager knows it, then then it's going to be in the office. Um, if you're going to allow people to work from home, you have to trust that they're going to be productive, that they're going to carry on doing the work, they're not just going to be sat in the garden. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's that's the big problem that the management and directors have had to face over the years. Mm-hmm. But this has made them face it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do, I do, I do think there's lots of individuals out there who who, who struggle working from home, mm-hmm. not just because of the work environment, because they struggle to motivate themselves. Um, and so yeah, you have to, to, you have to have a certain type of mentality, I think, to be able to work from home. Yeah. Um, and uh, for, in the in our team, because there's lots of work still coming in, you can, you know, people are still busy. You can, mm-hmm. They have to be busy. Um, but for other parts of the business, like the development team and the sales team, it's uh, it's all about motivation. So you have to be able to trust the individual to keep himself motivated, and that's that's a big, big question, mm-hmm. big ask. So I think that's where they'll they'll struggle with once this has been lifted. So that's why I still I still think you'll end up with about a fifty fifty split. What about um? What about the sort of in work surveillance like systems of actually seeing you know what what people are doing their time so online again, keystrokes again, 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 if you, you can't go down that route mm-hmm. you know we're not it's we're not working in a quick save where you've got your clock in your clock out you know we're not we're not, we're not working in that type of environment you're working in it professionals you have to you have to be able to trust the individual um so even though you know that there might be some people out there or not being as productive. You, if you go down the route of trying to do timesheets or monitoring them mm-hmm. and whatnot, or checking what websites are spending all day, it's, it's not it's not feasible. It's not feasible. Plus, mm-hmm. it's so easy to pretend that you're working when you're not actually working and whatnot. 
whatnot. So mm. it's all about trust. Um, if you don't have that trust, then you either need to make that employee come into the office, or you you don't you, you, you know you finish that that employment. You you sort of average day. Are you running like a nine to five? Do you manage to do sort of set hours? How does your work life balance kind of work out? Do you find that you're working till kind of late in the morning on on things, or are you just around when the customers are around? So do you kind of work around the normal office hours? Uh, so yeah, so I, 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 I make sure I do my forty hours a week. I try not to go over fifty hours a week, uh, but there is some weeks when you you have to do that extra, extra mile. Uh, but what? I want I want to better work from home with my customers. Mm-hmm. I don't want to spend three hours on the motorway. So if that means me being flexible with them, then I'm I'm more than happy to be flexible. So if they need me to be around at seven o'clock in the evening mm-hmm. to help them do something because I want to do it out of hours, and if that saves me three hours on the motorway, I'm more than happy to you know be there for seven o'clock. So um, for the normal for the normal support guys, they're sticking to their their routine of you know the start at eight, you finish at four, start at nine, you finish at five, mm-hmm. and my hours are nine till nine till five thirty. Mm-hmm. But I've, I've got full full reign on how and when I, I I log in and and deliver as long as as long as the the work's been fulfilled, as long as I'm um, not taking the piss and putting my hours in, uh, then. Uh, Management's happy, but again, it comes out of trust. If they they can trust me to deliver mm-hmm. on what they're asking, then then you know they're, they're more than happy to do that. Um, so I, I I be flexible with customers, but that's my role to be that flexible guy who helps customers meet their requirements and keep things moving. You know, I've moved out of that role where I'm just a support guy helping fix issues. Yeah, you know, it's it's it's, more, it's um, I've got to be a, I'm, I'm paid effectively to be that Mister Flexible. Mm. So. Uh, so if, yeah, if if uh, a customer needs to go live at midnight on a Saturday night, I've been there, done that. I've been in a data centre in London. Uh, so I was I was in a, a midnight data centre uh, doing a doing a go live. Uh, so yeah, we we're more than happy to be that flexible. But you get paid to be that flexible. You know, you're not you're not getting paid to be restrictive. You know, you get paid to help the customer. Yeah. So uh, in terms of the workload, then is it quite heavy? I mean, like I. Are you juggling several accounts at once, or are you like, like, are you ever chasing your own tail, or are you kind of on top of it? Is it steady? How how does that work? I've not been on top of it for, for about four or five years. Right. If if if, if that. Um, so my my job is to keep my my job is to keep fifteen balls juggling in the air. Yeah. And make sure none of them fall down. And if the one does fall down, make sure you capture and get back up in the air to keep juggling. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's, and I like that because it keeps me busy. You know, keeps my my mind busy. So. Yeah, I'm probably juggling 10, 15 different projects at a time, mm-hmm. um, dealing with t- 10 to 15 premium accounts at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's uh, that's uh, that's, a, that's a that's a good thing from my perspective because mm-hmm. it, it, it exposes you to lots of environments, it exposes you to lots of scenarios. It's, it's, I see it more of a me improve my skill set. If anything, being able to manage multiple manage accounts and uh, manage multiple issues at a time. Mm-hmm. Are there systems or have you designed systems of like, you know, keeping the track of who's who or is it all just done from memory and just from practice and um, what kind so, of yeah, assist I mean, do you get? Obviously, obviously we have um, um, CRM systems and, and whatnot and um, where it's all locked down. So it's all it's all logged. It's all in, in a, in, we use Salesforce. So it's all in Salesforce where management and sales guys can all track where, what's going on with these projects and whatnot. But I, I do rely heavily on what's in my head mm-hmm. and memory so but that's how i've always worked so i would say there's a vast i would say there's probably 70 80 percent in the head in my head and then uh and then maybe 30 percent 30 percent actually down on paper mm-hmm. um so the, the stuff that's down on paper saying so, you know the account name the account contact you know where they are the license you know stuff like that's all down on paper mm-hmm. but the it workings and the relationship and Knowing what's going on in the business, that's all in, in the person's head. That's why I'm again a trusted advisor because mm-hmm. I know the customer, I know the business, rather than it just being written down somewhere for me to read. Ignoring the the wider world for a moment, let's play fantasy as if everything was just going to stay the same. Would you like? Could you happily stay in this role till retirement, 
or would you expect something more or would you want new skills or new challenges or would you not necessarily know how you'd feel about it? Uh, I'd, I'd say the flexibility that I've got working from home and with having two kids, uh, I could see myself in this role for at least another five to ten years. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've all, um, if, if, I, if for whatever reason I stop working for the current organisation, I'll probably go freelance consultancy, mm-hmm. uh, do contracting work or consultancy work which I've done in the past as well. So I did that for about nine months. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd probably set up my own business. So that's, that would be my next step if mm. I stop working with the current organisation. But I would quite happily continue working with the current organisation for, for many years to come mm-hmm. um, and hopefully continue to grow within, within that company like I have done. So I've moved, I've moved up three roles since joining over 10 years. Mm. Salary's gone up with it, so... Um, but the the main thing is being able to work from home with the family. That's mm-hmm. definitely been a, a massive plus. I think if I was working down south, or if I was driving, if I was on site, the wife would probably be working part time, mm-hmm. not full time. So it allows the, the partner to work full time, mm-hmm. which then gives us more income. So it's not just about the income I get off my income; it's about the joint family household. Yeah. Why? Why haven't you been working in Leeds? I, like I've I've talked to people and you see a lot of stuff in Leeds at the moment about like you know Leeds being this great tech city outside of London and there's all these kinds of jobs that are supposedly are coming along in tech. Um, have there been the roles here and they've just not been suitable for you, or have you just found that there aren't really that that many tech jobs for you, or there's too much competition? What why why have you been working out of the city rather than in the city? Well, um, I, I would, first off, I, the organisation I work for pays a southern salary, mm-hmm. not a northern salary. Right. Um, that's the big advantage. It's, it's, if anything, it's harder for the, for the tech roles to compete against what I deliver, what I do for the, the southern organisation, because they're, they're paying, they're paying M4 London prices for their mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, so that's, that's one big thing. Uh, the other side is I've not been actively looking over the last, six, seven years. Mm-hmm. When I did last actively look, look, I got offered a job with Barclays Bank in Manchester. Mm-hmm. So again, I would have to uh, root the, uh, pick up the family and move them across the Pennines, which which uh, I, I turned down and accepted a better role at uh, the current company. Mm-hmm. So I thought I just used it to twist, twist some elbows. So I've not, I've not actively been looking. Uh, the last time I did actively look was 15 years ago and I got a job five minutes away from the house. Mm-hmm. So the second employer I had, the first was working down in Matlock and, and Neuner. Mm-hmm. The second one was working in Morley, in Leeds, which is near, near, near where I live. So that was a five, ten, that was a five, ten minute commute there and back. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and then I got the job working from home for the, for the company based down in Reading. Mm-hmm. So, um, I don't think it's a problem with Leeds. Um, I don't think I'd have a problem getting a job uh, in Leeds, mm-hmm. um, in, in IT security. Um, there's lots of IT resellers, um, security resellers, so, and my skill set is not, is not, it's niche, but not so niche where I couldn't cross trade into other products, mm-hmm. uh, pretty, pretty easily. So I'm quite confident of, of, uh, maintaining a job. Mm-hmm. I might not get paid as much as I do for a company based up in the north mm-hmm. for a similar role that I do. There might there might be the point there might be ten five ten grand lower yeah so there's prices uh so keeping that into mind I would probably still apply for jobs in London but working from home yeah <laughs> yeah it's good. it just it just makes sense nowadays but I also think that's then gonna have a trickle effect isn't it you know there's people now talking about moving out of London to work from home yeah because they can still do their job at home yeah but they reduce their cost of living so there's there's lots of lots of people now. Um, Thinking, you know, if, if we are moving to a world where we are working remotely, I don't need to be paying five hundred pound a week. I don't need to be in London, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, or I don't need to be in Leeds City Centre. You know, I can be on, I can be in a nice suburb on the outskirts. So, uh, yeah, I expect, I expect that to change. I don't think it's going to change as much as everybody thinks. I think in two years' time we will be back to similar where we are where mm. before. I think I think London transport uh, transport for London is just going to be as busy in two years' time as it was 
you know, at Christmas time. But I think um, there will be a, a slight change mindset. You know, there will be people working from home. Some businesses will change. Mm. But I do expect it to get back to normal within a, you know, two, to, two to three years, back to back to where we were. Mm. You know? And uh, So, yeah, there might be a small exodus, but I don't, I don't think it will be going to be a mass exodus from, from London. Mm. Or working from um, six centres like Manchester. But yeah, Leeds, Leeds is a. I, I, I don't see any reason to leave Leeds. It's got everything that I need. Mm. Um, it's got a football club I, I love, so I, I can't see myself <laughs> leaving. If, 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 if I do leave, it's because the, uh, the the cherry trees blossom about three weeks earlier down south than they, they do up here. Mm. Uh, so if I do leave, it's because it's slightly warmer, it's a slightly better climate down south. So that's that's if I do retire, move it to Devon. Or somewhere like that, um, or Essex. Maybe Kent. I like Kent. Kent sounds nice. The Garden uh, of England. So, yeah. So if I do, if I do retire, it will be, you know, because to to move to a slightly warmer climate. But then again, that depends on climate change. We don't know where we're going to be in ten years' time. Climate change. So uh, it's all it's all it's all a bit of an unknown, isn't it? Mm. Might never lead to lead, never, Might never leave Leeds. Would you ever work internationally? I, 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 so. I'm, I've worked internationally, uh-huh. so, I've, I've, so I've, I've been working with customers internationally, I've been on site. Again, with that's been moved, we've moved away from that. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've done plenty of work in Switzerland um, and in Ireland. There's not been any requirements to go out to the US as yet, but I, I would work. Uh, the, the team that we have, you know, we, um, we we have guys who go to Egypt and Saudi Arabia, uh, so we've got customers all over the place. We've got different regions, so we've got guys based out in Australia, mm-hmm. uh, the APAC regions. We've got guys based in, in the US, so they cover their local areas. Um, so we don't get much requirement to go to that, that side of the world because they've got their local local guys who do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but yeah, then there's there's times when um, you can't do the work remotely. You can't do the work over the phone. You need to be on site. Uh, it's a it's a closed network or something like that. So and. Uh, so there's a time when I'll need to go to Brussels, and mm. I'll need to go to The Hague and whatnot. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I don't like flying, but I am I am fine with it. You can always Eurostar. Eurostar's pretty good. Yeah. If I can get if I can get if I can get away with never if I can get away with never being on a plane again, being on site again, I'd be happy with that. Yeah, I'd agree with that. But that's not the, that's not the reality of the world. Yeah. I mean, in terms of actually working abroad, considering that you kind of will have to work at whatever hour with clients sometimes do you think it would actually make that much of a difference to you say you were working in a for someone in a different time zone so we, we, we do that kind of at the moment you know there's a lot of service contracts get farmed out to india mm-hmm. so we have to bridge that time zone mm-hmm. um so yeah we, we, we do that all already to some degree mm-hmm. um um when there's global meetings you know the the u.s guys need to get up get up late get up early mm-hmm. or, or, or whatnot or we need to stay on late so um there is that we need to have that we do have that flexibility around the time zones mm-hmm. uh, and it's becoming more and more as well especially with uh india picking up a lot of service contracts and level one level two support roles for for, for businesses so one of our some of our biggest customers um they're they're service desk and their server engineers are all based out of India. The servers might be in the UK, but the people look after them are based out of India. Yeah. So, yeah, we, 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 we've, um, we've had to... That's been a natural progression over the years. You know, as, as organisations have started using global resources, we've had to start accommodating global communication. So, has that been... I mean, let, let's talk about the shape of the industry a bit more. I mean, like, so... You you were another one that basically you were coming in coming into this this sector in the in the nineties you know like big explosion in IT and so on and it was a very different kind of landscape then you know most organisations didn't have their own IT people they would farm out most of the work and now most organisations will have an IT team uh, to do basic stuff and sometimes to build things in house but they'll still need consultants or need to bring in other people and designers and so on so. How how has that journey been? Has it been like a sort of stop start as it has been with the the economic side of it, or have you seen it on a more exponential kind of change thing? Like 
Do you think, where do you think the fastest changes occurred in the last sort of 30 years? 25 years? I think the biggest change, and it's been it's been happening over the last 10 to 15 years. So I think it was Google 15 years ago set up their business Google accounts. So people instead of, so small organisations still having their own local email server, mm-hmm. which, which they have to then manage and maintain. They just pay Google for their, their Google uh, business accounts. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, but we, it never really took off back, you know, 10 years ago. It's been a gradual progression. Um, and now, over the last two to three years, it's all about being Office 365 and organizations getting rid of their local email servers and it all going to the cloud. Mm-hmm. And that's only going to continue. Prior to that, it was a case of, uh, virtualizing everything so you'd have a server room full of hardware servers doing 15 different you know, jobs and whatnot and then uh, you install two new virtual servers that run virtual machines in them and you export all these physical machines into these two physical machines which are running virtual machines and you end up having a room an empty room so you had a room full of s- servers yeah Cables going everywhere, and you end up with, with two servers, with all virtualized. Yeah. So that started about 10 years ago, well, 10, 10, 15 years ago. You had this tie-off between some people using cloud-based services and some people, most people going to virtual, virtualizing uh, the products and the services. And then over the last five years, it's been, it's been uh, all right, we spent all this money on virtualization, but we can just put it in the cloud now. Yeah. All right, let's just put it in the cloud. So everybody's everybody's going cloud now. So the, the future will be Amazon Amazon servers, AWS servers, or, or Microsoft Azure servers. Um, we work with we work with hosting companies now. So our products are now hosted in in the cloud, and we have customers using it as a cloud based managed services. That's something I've been championing championing for for several years, but it's it's only last, these last three or four years we've actually got it off the ground. Mm. So, so yeah, but the that's gone hand in hand with the internet. So, if you go back fifteen years ago, organisations would pay five, ten grand a year for a one meg connection, mm. one megabyte internet connection. Every now at home has got like a hundred meg internet mm. connection that they spend that costs them thirty five pound a week. Fifteen years ago, you you pay five, ten grand for a one meg connection. Mm. Um, so you couldn't have that cloud-based service back then because you didn't have the internet connection to best support. It. Um, so you would need all your resources in-house. All the uh, all your staff would be using those in-house resources to to do their job. Um, and that fast forward ten years, uh, 10, 15 years now, um, I'd, I'd say probably about fifty, sixty percent of the resources organisations are using are in are not local. They're in there, supplied by somebody on the internet, or they move their resources to the internet, mm-hmm. and that's only going to continue. So you, you will you you will end up with an IT department maintaining the IT structure, but that structure will not be in an office. Mm-hmm. It won't be in a it won't be in a cabinet room that you that you support. It'd be a, it's going to be a service that they're they're renting off somebody, so renting off Microsoft or they're renting off Amazon, mm-hmm. uh, renting Amazon service. Uh, but that can only happen because we've now got the internet speeds that we have. So uh, that would have happened sooner, I think, but because the internet connection wasn't there, it wasn't feasible. Okay, uh, so two questions have sort of occurred to me. The first one is just like on the ecosystem of uh, of the firms that are out there. Like, I mean, generally it's kind of consolidation um, and there's a lot of kind of monopolistic trends. So, I mean, potentially you could have just... Like, why do you need these other companies? Why can't Amazon, Microsoft just supply all of it and hire everyone and and pay them? Um, like, do you think there's always going to be that that room for competition? And then the other question, yes, on, on, yes on that, you're always going to have somebody who can do the job, maybe not as good, mm-hmm. but it'll be cheaper. Yeah. And then that IT manager's got a budget, and he can either go get this cheap version. He's leaving a bit more money to go get that other thing that he wants. Mm-hmm. Or he's just got to spend it all on Microsoft. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, you, I, I think there'll always be there's always going to be more and more competition. Mm-hmm. Over the years, organisations have bought up other organisations, so you see a lot of the IT 
security firms have all been snapped up. So IT vendors that were big 10 years ago, you've not heard of for five years, six years, because they got bought out by somebody else. So McAfee's a good one. McAfee's got several products that they never built, but they just purchased and brought in-house. Mm. But all that does is then leave a little, it leaves room for that little firm to come along with that, with that product similar to, to what McAfee's just bought and sell it. It might not be as good as what the McAfee one's got, mm. but they can sell it a bit cheaper. So, yeah, McAfee doesn't just do antivirus nowadays. It does, it does everything. It does firewalls. It does, it does everything nowadays. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's always going to be room. I don't think, I don't think Amazon and Microsoft are, are, are monopolizing. That all they're doing is offering a good service, and you'll get IT managers and IT directors who want to go with the tried and tested and are happy to pay the premium for the tried and tested. And then you'll have other IT managers who want to be a bit more radical, mm. save a bit more money, get the similar service, maybe not as good, maybe it doesn't look as good, but it does pretty much the same thing. So you'll, you'll always get that as well. Do you think that, like to me, what you just said there, that kind of, I I view that as it depends on that manager of like having the actual technical knowledge and ability to be able to know what they're actually looking for. Whereas someone going for a brand is just kind of like, well, we'll go for the brand because I've heard of it. I mean, like that. So, yeah, it's, it's very much dependent on the, the company. So uh, some companies will have a, a tender process where mm. they will do a proper tender process. They'll evaluate what's on the market. Yeah. They'll decide what's on the uh, what's best for them. And they'll go through a full tender process and get a full agreement with the vendor to deploy exactly what they want and how they want it. Yeah. And then you'll have another organization where a new IT director will come in, he's read something in the magazine, in a, in a magazine, the, the article in the magazine sold it to him. As far as he's concerned, he's, he's doing that. Yeah. He's not interested in anything else, that's what he's doing. Yeah. So it's, it's very much dependent on the organization and the management structure, the decision-making people in that structure. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's, there's no set... There's no set standard there. It's very, it's very dependent on the organisation and the size of the organisation. The bigger the organisation, you tend to get more uh, tenders and uh, a more f- a thoughtful process mm-hmm. on what's going on on the bigger, bigger organisation. Now you still get big organisations that just go for the radical thing because they think you know, it's, the, it's what they need. The smaller the organisation, the, the mid-tier organisations, they, they, they tend to be the one who want to try and save money. Mm-hmm. You know, and and maybe go for that new technology, which is cheaper rather than the tried and tested. Yeah. And then you go down to the small small organisations, and they just want peace of mind. Yeah. So they'll they'll probably go with the tried and just try tried and tested because they just want peace of mind. They they ain't got time to be ringing support calls and, and troubleshooting stuff. You know, there's a there's there's it's two man IT team in a in a hundred hundred people organisation. They just want it to work. Mm-hmm. So they're not interested. So if they need to pay a little bit more. To go with Microsoft because they know it's going to work rather than some other vendor, then uh, they'll, they'll, just, they'll just go with that, 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 that try, and test, try and test it. So you don't get, yeah, the people, the mid the mid tier is, is where you get, so there's like 500, 1,000 employees, those type of organizations where you've maybe got five, 10 IT staff where they'll they'll think, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll evaluate stuff, but they might go for those cheaper products. Because they know they can maintain it, and then they've got the staff to troubleshoot it. If mm-hmm. any issues, log support calls, uh, and it saves them budget. Mm-hmm. And then if they can save budget, they've got more training and whatnot. Where and then there's the enterprise organisations where you're looking at twenty thousand, hundred thousand users, and again they just want peace of mind. They're not interested in troubleshooting stuff. Yeah, you know they have got they've got a hundred man IT team, but they'll proper tender stuff out and they'll go with the tried and tested. But they'll just they'll have, they'll have the vendors sat down in the room and they'll get them all fighting out between themselves until they get a decent price out of one of the tried and tested solutions mm. and they'll just go with that well i think as well with that kind of thing they look for the the sort of internal knowledge as well like you know you would if you've got a hundred you're not going to ask a hundred of your it staff i mean you might but you're going to go from some of the feedback of what the staff are saying as well like what they've heard like this this has these weaknesses, you know, because everyone's got different pieces of information that they're holding in little anecdotes. Ultimately, it's going to be someone higher up's decision. I but think I think that, that that comes into play more on the, on the mid tier yeah. organizations, whereas on the big bigger organizations, they're they're it's more money oriented. Yeah, it's just it's like tried and, te- tried and tested and money. So it's those big organizations that are using the Indian 
service desks and call centers and outsourcing their their, their hardware resource, the hardware maintenance, server server maintenance out to out to them. But they're also the ones who would prefer to go with a tried and tested solution mm-hmm. and have the clout to have go to a tender process and have, mm-hmm. the, have the vendors fighting over their business because mm-hmm. they've got it's you know it's a big it's a big deal it's not like it's a multi million pound deal mm-hmm. um so so they don't I, I i don't think they rely so much on the internal it resource because they it's more of they know they're going with the tried and, test, tried and tested vendor sort of solution and uh they know they've got a decent it team to be, uh, react to it yeah um whereas that mid-tier organization They'll listen. They might be a little bit more hooked into the the IT team and their skill sets, and and are more interested in saving lots of money mm-hmm. if possible, going with a solution which maybe not as good but does the job. Mm-hmm. But they've got, but they've got like a ten man IT team to be able to support that, and they've got the the knowledge within that team who who are championing those those mid tier products. Mm-hmm. Um, so they do get listened to, and then again you go down to the small business two man team, and they're just they're just firefighting, yeah. You know, uh, laptop rebuilds and whatnot. So they just want um, to try and test a solution again. Yeah. So yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit weird how, how it works when you go between um, small business, mid tiers, enterprise. So that was episode ten. I uh, hope you liked that interview. As I said before in the intro, I will be re-recording all the intros and outros for these shows. Um, I think that I need to create the in- curate the interviews a bit better. My initial intent was just for audience members to kind of discover the interviews as I did, but I don't think that works, and it, I don't think it's fair to the audience either. So I'm going to put a bit more guidance and information in for people, and that will give people more of a sense of what they're actually clicking on before they click it, so that will help them, and hopefully bring the right people yeah as i say i haven't scripted any of these so i don't want to go on too long but this has been interesting um it would have been interesting anyway but it was interesting to do this year in particular and it kind of reinforced for me that this is an important thing to do that this decade is going to see a lot of things like this i mean this is uh, i expected things like crazy covid chaos in the 2020s like i knew this decade was going to be worse than all the others shall we put it that way um but i didn't really expect it to happen this soon um and i don't expect things to return to normal and i don't expect things to improve i expect to see a lot more things like this so i do think it's important to kind of capture it uh, if there's anyone around to listen and learn from it um so yeah, so I have been, what's the word I'm looking for, both endorsed and uh, discouraged by this year. So as I say, for volume two, I do want more episodes. So if you are someone that's listening to this and you're a lawyer or you're based in Leeds and you're interested in the show, I would say the best thing to do is come on the show um it's the best way for you to be involved with the show i mean like to actually experience it and to take part um i'm trying to get a thousand people here over 10 years which should be 100 people a year uh obviously i'm gonna have to build up to that but um given that i've only got 10 for this year 10 that i've published I'm quite far behind. So, yes, be a guest on the show. That would be very good. I would be very much appreciative for that. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up there. So, everyone have a fantastic holiday season to the best of your abilities. And I hope you all stay as safe as possible. And keep listening. And come on the show. And share the show. And be a patron. And support the show and 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 maybe sit down and have a nice brew okay uh that's it for me i will be back with volume two which will be better i promise um i will get better at this okay bye the working hours podcast is made by western studios leads 
If you're in Leeds and have a podcast idea that you would like to develop, then email makemypodcast at western-studios.com with some details about what you would like to achieve, and let's start making your podcast a reality today. Follow Western Studios on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram for news on new episodes of Working Hours, and also new original podcast productions which are coming soon from Western Studios Leeds. 